In the last class, we were talking about implementing generic methods. So a generic method is a method that has a type parameter or a type variable. Now, to keep things simple, uh, we started out making a class called Stacks. Uh, Stacks itself is not generic, so the class is not generic. Um, inside the class, though, there are some methods. So clear, push all, pop all, and these methods are generic. Right? And so when you create a generic method in the class, uh, the generic types or the, your type variables, they have to appear um, inside angled brackets. They also must appear in front of the return type. Uh, so the location has to be there uh, when in your method uh, signature, um, in your method header, sorry. Uh, each method gets its own type variable, right? So unlike a class where you mark the type as being generic for the entire class, right? Each method gets its own type variable. So here, this T is applicable only to clear. This T is applicable only to push all. And this T here is applicable only to pop all. All right, so the first three methods that we had in the last class were pretty easy to implement. They're just one line, basically one or two lines. Uh, the next method is a little more complicated. Uh, and so we want to write a method called contains. Now contains takes in a stack and it searches the stack for a particular element. Um, contains should not modify the stack that's passed in, right? If someone asks you to search um, their collection, you probably they, that person probably doesn't want you to also change that collection somehow, right? So they don't want you to change the order or remove elements or add elements to that collection. So this method is the same. Now that makes this really inconvenient to implement this method. Why is it hard to implement? Because you're inside of a class called stacks, right? The inputs to your methods are just, uh, uh, the, your type is just stack. So it's the interface type, right? And so the clear method doesn't know what kind of stack this is. It doesn't know if it's an array stack or if it's a linked list stack or whatever. Um, it just knows that it's getting some stack. Right. And so that makes it really hard to implement contain, right? Because if you want to search an array based stack, right, you would just iterate over the elements of the array. If you wanted to search a stack using linked nodes that was implemented using linked nodes, you would write a loop that follows each node. Here, we don't have that information. Right? All we all that we know is that we've got some sort of stack, right? And so that's annoying. So we need some way now to search a stack without permanently changing it. So uh, it becomes inefficient to do so. Um, it's possible. And so the idea is, is you pop all the elements of the input stack onto a temporary stack until the input stack is empty or until you find the thing that you're looking for. Right. Once this condition is true, so either the stack is empty or you found the thing you're looking for, you're then going to undo everything by popping each element of the temporary stack and putting them back onto the original stack, right? So that restores the original stack. So as far as the user is concerned, it's unchanged, right? Um, and it uh, correctly, and hopefully it'll correctly search uh, the stack for the element. So this is a picture of what's uh, going to happen. So we're looking for the Z inside the stack S, right? And so the first thing we do is we make a temporary empty stack. And now you start to pop elements off of S. I think, yep. So you pop elements off of S into the empty stack. Every time you pop an element, you're going to check, is this element equal to the Z, right? So is the D equal to the Z? The answer is no. So D goes into temp. Keep on repeating the process. So is the C equal to Z? The answer is no. So it goes into temp, right? Is the B equal to Z? The answer is no. It goes into temp. And is the A equal to Z? The answer is no, so it goes into temp, right? And at this point here, the original stack is now empty. And so we know at this point, the stack does not contain the, uh, the letter Z. So eventually we're going to return false, but we have to restore the state of S, right? And so to restore the state of S, uh, we're just going to pop the temporary stack and put all the elements back onto S. Right, and so that restores the original state of S, right? And we've searched the stack, right? We know the Z is not in the stack. Okay, so this is what it ends up looking like. So our method is called contains, 
right? It takes in a stack of some element type T, right? We're going to search for the object OBJ. The method is generic, so the T shows up over here as our generic type parameter. Right? There is our new empty stack. Now here, it doesn't matter what kind of stack we use, right? We just need some kind of stack. So I've chosen to use array stack. You could use a list stack. You could use a linked stack, whatever you like. It doesn't matter what kind of stack is here. It's just a temporary stack, right? This loop pops elements off of the original stack S, right? So while that stack is not empty, uh, and we haven't found the thing we're looking for. Pop the stack. Right. Look at the element that just got popped. Is it equal to OBJ? Right. So we can write elem equals here because we know that um, every uh, object in equals, sorry, every object in Java has an equals method. Right. And so we uh, we can determine whether or not the element is equal to the thing we're searching for. Right. If we find the thing that we're searching for, the result is true, right? We're going to push the element onto the, the element we just looked at onto the temporary stack, right? If we found the thing we're looking for, the loop will stop, right? If not, the loop will continue until the stack is empty. Right? Once we've searched the stack, we have to undo what we've done. So now you just pop the temporary stack until it's empty. Every time you pop, you push the element back onto the original stack. Right? You have to, well, do you have to use a stack here? You don't have to use a stack here. You could use a list if you wanted to, right? But when you empty out the list, uh, you have to work from the back uh, to the front. Um, here it's convenient to use a stack uh, because we know that um, because of the, we know that when you push elements onto a stack, they come back out in their reverse order, right? And so that lets us restore the state of the original stack, right? Notice that this is really awkward to write, right? So look at, um, the algorithm itself is awkward. It requires temporary storage that's proportional to the number of elements in the original stack, right? And it requires two different loops to accomplish um, all of our work, right? If you just wanted to search for uh, an element in an array-based stack, you just have to loop over the array once, right? So in other words, if you really want contains, um, and if you have access to all of your stack classes, it makes more sense to put contains inside the classes themselves, right? That way you can exploit the uh, the fact that you know how the class is implemented and you can search the collection uh, or the stack a lot easier, right? If you don't know, uh, if, you, if you don't have access to the source code for stack and you really want this contains method, you're stuck doing something like this. All right, so we're gonna do the exact same thing for queues, just so that you have uh, more examples of what these generic methods look like. So we're gonna do clear for a queue, we're going to do NQ all, DQ all for a queue, and we're gonna do contains for a queue. Okay, so clear for a queue is similar to clear for a stack. You just iterate until the queue is empty, DQing the queue at each step. Right. Okay, again, our method is generic because we're gonna take in a queue of some type Right, some element type T, right? So our generic type shows up here. Just like with the stack version of Q, we never actually use T inside the method, right? So yes, the method is generic. Right? There is this type here, but inside the method itself, that type T is never used, right? When you see this sort of situation, you should sort of wonder, is this type really needed, right? Did we really need to mention this type T here? Right, the answer is going to turn out to be no. Uh, and so to resolve this issue, we need to wait a few lectures uh, so that you can see there is a syntax where you can not specify that type there uh, in Java, but it's a like everything else, it's kind of awkward. OK, what about NQ all? So NQ all takes the elements from a source collection and adds them to a destination uh, queue. Right. Here, the types matter. So here, the type for uh, the elements in the collection, uh, they have to match, question mark, the element type in the queue, right? Otherwise, I can't add them to the queue, right? So if the types aren't the same, it doesn't make sense. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem to make sense that I can add these elements to this uh, queue, right? Again, you don't want to modify the source collection, right? 
So we're just going to loop over the source collection. We're not going to remove the elements from the source collection, right? We're just going to loop over it and add the elements to the destination queue, right? So that's pretty easy. Notice that the type does in fact appear inside the method, right? So it looks like we really do need the type name here, uh, T uh, inside, uh, sorry, for this uh, method here. And DQ all is similar to pop all, uh, sorry, is similar to push all for the stack. Uh, sorry for the queue, that should be Q, sorry. So for DQ all, we're going to take the elements from the queue, the source queue. We're going to remove all the elements from there and add them to the destination collection. Right. Again, your types have to match here, question mark. Right. Uh, it doesn't make sense to take the elements out of the queue and add them to a collection of a different kind of element. Right. So that T and that T match. Right. Again, though, inside the method, that type name is never mentioned. So that's a bit. Uh, so that is also interesting. Right. Here, the uh, type names are needed to make sure uh, that the element types from the source are compatible with the element types in the destination. All right, so the only interesting method in all of this is contains. So for contains for a queue, uh, again, we're in, stuck in the situation where we don't know what kind of queue we have. All that we know is that we have a queue. Right. So I don't know if we have an array based queue or a linked list based queue um, or a list based queue. Right. We just have some sort of queue. So again, as with the uh, contains method with stack, right? I want to search this queue, but I don't want to change permanently change the queue. Right. So unlike the stack method, though, you don't need um, you don't need uh, any extra storage in this case. Right, so I don't need a temporary queue or a temporary stack in this case, right? I can play a trick with the queue, right? So the way this works is you know how many elements are in the queue. So you know that if you take out queue size elements from the queue, the queue will be empty, right? If I put queue size elements back in the queue, I know that the queue has, uh, is has the correct number of elements. So the trick here is EQ the queue, Right. Look at the element. Right. Is the element equal to the one you're looking for? Right. And if it is, right, you can set the result to true. Right. Notice that if the result is already true. You don't have to do this check for equals. Right. So that saves you um, some time. Uh, if, so if you already found the element that you're looking for, you don't have to look for it again. Uh, so if you find the element that you're looking for, set result to true, right? But we don't stop the loop or anything like that. We just keep on going, right? So every time you dequeue the element, you just put it back into the end of the queue, right? And so all this does is that it, for every element in the queue, it takes it out and sticks it back at the end, right? When you've iterated over all the elements in the queue, the queue is restored back to its original state. So for a queue, this method is a, a little bit more straightforward to implement than for a stack, right? You don't need any temporary storage. You only need one loop. All right, so you can cook up a whole bunch of other methods that you might want to uh, have that uh, for queues and for stacks, right? If the method that you're implementing needs or could exploit the structure of the queue or the structure of the stack, right? It's probably better to put those methods inside the um, stack and queue classes themselves, right? If you have to put them outside, you end up doing funny stuff like this, right? Uh, and there was a lecture a couple of days ago, I guess, or a couple of lectures ago um, where I left you with a couple of problems. Um, I think one was implement a copy constructor for a queue or a stack. Um, another one was implement equals and so on and so on and so forth. Right. They're all going to look end up looking something like this um, or something like the stack where you have to. Do something to look at all the elements in the queue without actually knowing what uh, or actually knowing the structure of the queue. <laughs> Alright, so there's uh, generic methods. Right. Alright, so let's go back now and look at this. So we're going to now that we know about interfaces and generic uh, classes and generic interfaces, when we make a list, we're going to start out by making a generic list. 
right? We're going to implement it in a couple of ways, which I think most of you already know how to do, right? We'll look at the advantages and disadvantages of doing so. Um, and the thing that you don't know how to do, I don't think, is that we're going to make an iterator for all of our lists. All right, so remember what a list is. It's just a collection of elements, right? They are a held in a linear sequence. You're able to get any element out of the list, right? So you access it by its index. Right? You know that the standard library has an array list class, right? Uh, I think I mentioned it. The standard library has a linked list class as well. We've never used it. Um, it's useful to look at how you implement these lists. So for you guys, it's less useful because you've already done it, I think, in your data structures course. For the computing students, they've never done this sort of thing before when they hit this course. Uh, so it's useful to show them how these things exactly work so that they understand why is an array list have, uh, so why does an array list have an O and remove method, right? Why isn't it in, uh, why isn't it in O1 or something else? Okay, so we don't want to implement the full list interface, right? Java's list interface is quite rich. Um, it's not worth implementing all the methods for this course. So we're going to look at a small-ish number of them. Right? We want to be able to get an element, set an element. We want to be able to add an element and remove an element. The second add method inserts into the middle of the list. Right, So it's useful to look at insertion as well. And finally, the stuff that should be new for all of you is this iterator method. So we want to make a list interface. So I'm going to call it S list. This is for a simple list. Right. All of the methods that I just described are here. Right. Now notice the interface itself. Uh, an interface is allowed to um, implement another, not implement, allowed to extend another interface. Right. So uh, if you want an interface to extend another interface, right, you just use extends again. Right. So what this does is it creates an interface called S list that is a sub interface of iterable. Right. All that means is that every S list is also an iterable object. Right. And remember what iterable does. Right. Iterable is the thing uh, or is the interface that forces a class to have an iterator method. Right. And so that's why iterator shows up here now. Right, we want an iterator uh, because you want uh, people to be able to use an iterator to uh, iterate over your list. Right, so we'll start with an array, uh, an array based list. This is basically very similar to an array based stack. Um, if you inserting, uh, so when you add an element to a list, it always adds at the end. Right, well, sorry, we're always going to add at the end. Right, in some data structure courses, you might. Uh, implement a list where you add at the front, uh, but we're going to add at the end. Right. Okay, so uh, so to add at the end, you know how to do that, right? That's exactly the same as for a stack. The only things that require any explanation uh, would be when you insert into the middle of the list or when you um, remove an element from the list, right? So when you remove from the middle, right? because you have to do a little bit of extra work. So when you insert an element into a list at a specified index, right? What that forces you to do, so I want to insert a new element at index four. That forces you to move all of the existing elements at the index and after the index one position to the right so that I can actually put in a new element at index four, right? So in other words, I need to take all the elements shown in red and I need to shift them one position to the right, right? So when you shift it to the right, you're going to start at the end, right? So the eight's going to move to the nine, the seven will move to the eight, the six will move to the seven, right? You can't start from the front. If I start from the four, the four overwrites the five, right? And now when you move it again, the four ends up in the six, and then the four ends up at the seven, and then the four ends up in the eight, and so on and so on and so forth, right? So the only thing that you have to be careful about when you shift to the right is that you start at the end of the list. So after you shift the elements, that opens up a space, and now I can insert the new element into that space. Uh, the weird thing about insert, so you, you're specifying an index. Um, insert at the end of the list, you are allowed to specify an invalid index. Right? So the last valid index for this list is nine. 
uh, but the way that inserting uh, usually works, uh, or at least the way it works in Java is you can insert at element 10, at index 10, right? And that is legal, uh, which is unusual because that index is not technically valid. Okay, if you want to insert at the end of the list though, you don't have to do any work, right? You just call your plain old add method and add automatically adds to the end of the list. So that's easy to do. If you want to do, if you want to remove from the middle of the list, right? So I want to remove the four, right? Um, I can't just remove the element because that leaves a hole in the array, right? So what you have to do is you have to shift elements one position to the left. Right. So in other words, to remove the four, right? All the elements in red need to move one position to the left. When you're moving to the left, you start at the front, right? So the five goes to the four, the six goes to the five, and so on and so on and so on. Right. The only question is, is what happens to the element that was at the 10? So it turns out we're just going to null out that element and uh, that'll, that'll, that will remove uh, uh, that does that uh, means that there's no extra elements hanging around in the array. Whoops, sorry. All right. So that takes us to the next set of slides. Uh, this is 30. All right, so that previous picture should make it clear that if you're inserting or removing from the middle of a list, uh, those operations happen in O n time, right? You might have to move up to n minus one elements every time you insert or remove um, into the middle of a list, right? In particular, if you insert at the front, right, you have to move all of the existing elements one position to the right. If you remove from the front, you have to move all of the other elements one position to the left, right? So if you have a problem where you need to remove or add, from the middle of a list, right? You don't want to use an array-based list, right? Every time you call that operation, it's going to be an ON operation. Okay, so how does this work? So the list basically looks exactly like a stack, right? So all the fields are exactly the same, right? I have an array of big O object to hold my elements, right? The class is generic, right? So my S array list class. Right, has some element type E, right? It's going to implement our S list interface, which also has some element type E. Right, remember, we can't have an array of type E, so we make an array of big O object instead. Right, and now everything um, looks the same as a stack. Right, so the constructor makes an empty list. Oh, sorry, makes a list of size 16. Right, sets the size to zero. Size does nothing except return the size. Okay, so what does add do? Add's exactly the same as push for stack. Right. So is the array full? Right. If the array is full, make a copy of the array of the old array, right? Double its length and assign that back to our array field, this.arr. Once you've done that, set the element at this dot size to elem to the add the element that you want to add, and then add one to the size. Right, that's the exact same thing as what push looks like for stack. Okay. Now all of the list operations, not all, many of the list operations take in an index. Right. You should validate the index for all these operations. You don't want to repeat your code over and over and over again. It's very tedious, right? Sticking this into all of your methods. So create a little private method that will check an index for a given list. If the index is less than zero, throw an exception, right? If the index is greater than or equal to the size of the list, that's also invalid, so throw an exception, right? Now, every time I have a method that uses an index, I can just call check index. Okay, how do you implement get? So get gets an element out of the list at that index, right? I've got an array, so this is easy. I just get the element at that uh, from the array at that index. Right, so check the index, right? If the index is fine, go into the array at that index. Right? Now remember that element is a big O object, right? The get needs to return an element of type E, right? So you need the cast here. Right? So cast your big O object to type E and away you go. Set 
is basically the same as get, right? You're going to set the element at that index, right? Set uh, typically in Java returns the element that's overwritten, right? So I need to get the element that was overwritten or that will be overwritten. I'm just going to use get uh, to get that element. You should probably go into the array and just grab the array element, right? Uh, but I'm going to use get. Go ahead and overwrite the element. Oh, by calling get. Oh, that's why I'm doing it this way. So by calling get, get validates the index here, right? Uh, and so that does your test for you there as well, right? Go in and look at, uh, go in and overwrite the element, and then finally return the old value. Okay, what about add? So this version of add, this is actually insert, right? Why Java decides to call it add, I don't know. It's actually insert. So this inserts an element at that index. And so this is the method that has to shuffle stuff around, right? So if you want to insert in the middle, you shuffle elements to the right, right? So the shuffle, the elements to the right part is here. Right? So you want to move the elements at index size minus one, size minus two, dot, 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 down to index, one position to the right, right? So here's the case where because you're moving elements to the right, you want to start at the end of the list. Right. What's the element at the end of the list? Well, it's at size minus one. Right. How long do you want the loop to run? Well, I want to move everything from the end of the list up to the insertion point to the right. So as long as I is greater than or equal to the index, right? You're counting down. So I minus minus. Right. Now I want to move the element one position to the right. So I want to move that element one position to the right. Right. So add I plus one. Right, there's a question mark. Can this throw? Right, you wor you're worried that this might throw because of that i plus one. Right, I know that i is a valid index for sure. Right, i is a valid index because um, its maximum value is size minus one. Right, I know that fits into the array. Right, I know the index is valid because I got past the check index here. Right, so I know i is fine. The only question is, is i plus one fine? Right, if you reason it out. Right, the largest value of i plus one is this size minus one plus one, so it's this dot size. Right, can this is this dot size always valid for the array? It is because uh, if the index is equal to this dot size, we do something else. Right, we add to the end of the list instead. Right, and then return that return statement turns out to be important. Right, so we know that that never throws an exception. Finally, down here, um, add the element to the list, right? So we've shuffled all the elements one position to the right, insert the element into the hole that we just made in the array, and then don't forget to add one to the size. There is an error in this method. Can you see what it is? Uh, there is an error in this method. Uh, is there an error in this method? If index equals size, add the element in the list. Oh yeah, there is an error in this method. Does anybody see what it is? Actually, it's not so much an error. There's no mission. Anybody? Anybody? Anybody got it? OK, so we're, uh, I guess the name add is useful. It gives you a hint to what's going on here, right? So uh, inserting into the array, you're going to increase the size of the array, uh, the list by one, right? Uh, if you look in the method, right, there's nowhere that actually tests whether or not. So if you add at the end, everything's fine. This method always works, right? It works because we're just going to call our add method, which adds to the end of the list, right? Now, remember what that method also does, right? So that method checks, is there space in the array for the new element? And if there isn't, it expands the size of the array. So if you add at the end, this always works. Problem is nothing in here tests whether or not there's space in the array for the new element, right? It simply shuffles the elements over one position to the right, um, and then um, adds the element into the hole, right? So before you do anything, right? Before you start moving elements around right there, right? You need to test is there space in the array? And if there isn't, you have to resize the array. 
right? So that's the error, right? You may have to resize the array uh, before you start to move elements around. Okay, what about remove? So remove, you're going to move elements to the left, right? Uh, remove also removes the elements that you removed. So I'm going to remember what that value is first, right? Again, I'm going to call get. By calling get, I get the test for whether or not the index is valid because get tests the index for us. Okay, so now we start moving elements to the left, right? Which elements do I want to move? I want to start at index plus one and then index plus two and so on and so on and so on, right? Up to the last element of the list and I want to move them one position to the left, right? So I want to move the element at index i. One position to the left, right? That i minus one, you have to ask the question, can that go out of bounds, right? So i is always valid, so that's fine. Can the i minus one go out of bounds? So in other words, can it become negative? The answer is no, right? Because the smallest value for i is um, one, right? If the index is zero, i becomes one, one minus one is zero, that's always a valid index, right? So not worried about any exceptions happening here. Right. Finally, we've moved all of the elements in the array one position to the left, right? And that means that uh, we haven't moved them. We just copied them over one position to the left, right? So we didn't really move them. Uh, and that means the element that was at the end of the um, list is still sitting there, right? Or a copy is still sitting there, right? It's important that you null out that copy there, right? So you null out the element there. You don't null out the value there. Uh, that means there is a reference sitting in the array that refers to an object, right? Uh, and that means that object can't be freed. Um, the memory for that object can't be freed, right? So in other words, um, if you have a list, you have a million elements in the list, and then you remove everything from the list. Sorry, if you, yeah, if you remove the elements from the list, and you don't know all the elements, right? The million objects are still in memory, right? They're still stuck because there's a reference in the array pointing to those elements, right? So you have to remove that reference so that the virtual machine can actually clear up those objects. Finally, decrease the size of the list by one and return the removed element. All right, so hopefully that was more or less a review for uh, most of you. Um, so hopefully you implemented an array-based list in your data structures course, right? The only interesting part is this iterator method, right? So the iterator method, uh, we want to provide an iterator for our list class, right? The reason you want to do so is so that someone can write a for each loop um, over your list, right? Uh, there's also another reason. Uh, if you want the user to loop over your list and remove elements as they loop, the only safe way to do this is with an iterator. Um, if you try to call remove as you're iterating over the list, uh, you can run into problems, right? Um, you can end up with a list that becomes, uh, you can end up with an array that whose state becomes invalid. So we wanna provide an iterator for our list, right? And the pattern is gonna be the same as before. Uh, so when we created an iterator for our range class, Right. You provide an iterator method, right? and it returns an array iterator object. Right. The array iterator class is, is defined inside of the list class itself. Right. So we make it a private class, right? and it implements the iterator interface. OK, so. This is a private class, it's not static, right? So that makes this a nested uh, inner class in Java, right? Remember what that means. So an inner class in Java has access to its outer class field. Right? So every array iterator gets access to the array and the size field of our list, right? It needs access to the array so that it knows which element it's iterating, uh, which element is currently the current element um, in the iteration. Uh, furthermore, you can't have an array iterator without having an array list as well. What am I calling it? S array list, right? Without having an S array list object as well. 
OK, so remember how iterators work. How much are we? OK, so what is an iterator? Right, so an iterator is just an object that knows how to iterate over a sequence of values. Right, so an iterator over a list knows how to move from element to element to element in the list. Uh, using an iterator object is the only guaranteed safe way of iterating over a collection and removing elements during the uh, iteration. Right. I never actually told you how to do this in the um, lectures, but if you read the, if you want to know how to do this, you can look at the notebooks uh, and they show you how to do this. Right. I'm not going to ask you how to do this in the course. If you want to write a for each loop over your object, that thing has to, your object has to provide an iterator object um, for the for each loop to work. OK, so when we talked about iterator before, I told you it had two methods, has next and next. It turns out there's a third method that I didn't tell you about. Right? Uh, that method is remove. Right? And so um, using an iterator, right, you can remove an element from the thing that you're iterating over um, as you're performing uh, the iteration. Right? So inside the uh, interface iterator, Remove is defined like that, right? So it's defined as a default method, so it has an implementation. Notice that the implementation does nothing but throw an exception, right? So if you look at the documentation for iterator, it says remove is an optional uh, method, right? The way that they make it optional is that the default implementation throws an exception. So if you don't override remove in your class, anytime someone tries to use it, they just get uh, they get an exception instead. Now, for our list iterator, we want to provide remove so that you can actually remove an element from the list as you're iterating over it. All right, so how are we going to do this? So this may, uh, to in order to do this correctly, you have to go and look at what remove says it actually does. Right. So it behaves a bit funny for the iterator, uh, for the iterator type, sorry. So if you look at the definition of remove, it says that remove removes the element that was most recently returned by next. Right. Remember the way that how you use an iterator. Right. Um, use an iterator by calling next. Right. So every time you call next, you get the current element in the iteration, and then the iterator moves to the next element. Right. So next does two things. Right. It returns the current element and then moves to the next element. Right. Has next returns true if there's still more elements to look at. Remove removes the element that was most recently returned by next. Right. So you have to call next before you can call remove. Right. Furthermore, you can only call remove once each time you call next. Right. So you call next, look at the element. If it's the thing you want to remove, you remove it. Right. But you can't call remove again until you call next one more time. Right. So if you call remove without first calling next, or if you've already called removed for the most recent call to next, you get an exception, right? You're supposed to throw in a legal state exception. OK, so using remove lets you filter a collection, right? So filtering a collection means you're going to iterate over the collection, removing elements as you go. Right? So for example, if you want to remove all the negative values from a list, uh, this is the way you have to. This is the way you're supposed to do it. Right? It's awkward. Right? So I have a list called. I have a list called T or a set. It doesn't matter. Right? Uh, this is the one time where you commonly would make an actual iterator object. Right? So you make an iterator. This is a list of integer or a set of integer. So it's an iterator over integers. You call the iterator method and get a reference to an iterator. Right. Your loop condition is iter has next. Right. So as long as there's still another element to look at, there's no update condition. Right. So I'll explain why there's no. So the reason there's no update condition is, is because normally in the update condition, you're going to, you would want to advance the iterator to the next element. Right. That's normally how you'd write it. So if you're writing a counting style loop, you add one to I, right? So I is your index, which kind of represents the iterator. 
the next method for the iterator class automatically advances the iterator one position, right? So that's why there's no update condition here, right? So calling next gives you the current element in the iteration, advances the iterator, right? So now you can look at the value, right? Here I'm trying to remove all the negative values from the list. So if the value is negative, remove the value, right? And so you remove the value by asking the iterator to remove the value for you. Now, notice that thing right there, right? If I want the iterator to remove the value, right? The iterator needs access to how the list is storing or how the collection is storing stuff, right? Because it has to modify the collection uh, in order to actually remove that element. Uh, and so our, uh, our array iterator is going to need some way to access the array belonging to the list. All right, so how do these iterators work? So the way to think about these iterators um, is that it's similar to a cursor um, on your, I guess, your uh, your text editor or your word processor, right? So that blinking line there uh, is the location of the cursor, right? If you start to type, right, it starts to insert stuff between the Y and the I, right? You can imagine that your iterator is similar to a cursor, right? So it doesn't look, it doesn't sit or it doesn't point to a particular element, it sits between elements. Right. So this red thing is my picture of an iterator, right? So here, my iterator sits between the elements uh, at indexes seven and eight, right? Until it's six, okay. So the way we're gonna implement this iterator is we're going to remember uh, the index in front of the iterator and the index, oops, sorry, that's immediately after the iterator, right? So this iterator here uh, has a, a value of previous equal to seven and a value of next equal to eight, right? Now, next, previous and next are not always going to be different by one. So you're gonna see what happens in just a second, right? So calling next, right? means I want to return the six. So I want to return the element to the right of the iterator, right? And then I want to move the iterator one position to the right, right? So if I call next with this iterator, we're going to return the six. Sorry, oh, I'm sorry, what just happened? I want to return the six and then I want to move the iterator here, right? So that is between the elements uh, at indexes eight and nine. Right. When the iterator is at the front of the list, right, it's going to start here. Okay, so after you call next, the iterator moves one position to the right. Right. If you keep on calling next until you've visited all the elements in the list, right, the iterator ends up here. Right. So at this point, has next will return false. Right. There is no more. There are no more elements in the iteration are in the list, right? And next we'll throw an exception, right? So if you call next with that iterator there, right? Um, it will throw an exception because there are no more elements to look at. And at the start of the list, right? There is no previous element, right? So we're gonna set previous equal to minus one in this case, right? Next will be zero, right? So remember previous and next, those are the indexes uh, that the iterator is sitting between. Okay, so how do you implement the class? Actually, what time is it? Do I want to do this right? Yeah, okay, so our array iterator class sits inside of the list class itself, right? Our field next is the index of the element returned by the next call to next, right? Previous is the index of the element returned by the most recent call to next. I need that index because for remove, that's the element I have to remove, right? So I need to remember what element did we just look at in order to remove the element, right? I'm gonna set previous to minus one if we remove the element, right? So why am I gonna do that, right? So why do we set previous to minus one if we remove the element? So if we call remove on the iterator, right? I'm gonna set previous to minus one. I'm gonna do that to remember that we've called remove once for the most recent call the next, 
right? If someone tries to call remove again, that should throw an exception. So we're going to look at the value of previous and look and see if it's minus one. Right? If it's minus one, I know that uh, we're not allowed to call remove and we're going to throw an exception. Right. OK, so the class, remember, is a nested inner class or just inner class. Right. Remember, that means that our iterator has access to the enclosing to the members of the enclosing class. Right, so we have access to the array and the size field belonging to S array list. There is our new, uh, there's a constructor that makes a new iterator. Okay. So this is the iterator that starts at the front of the list. Right, next is zero. Right, and previous is minus one. Right, so remember, oh, it's this picture right here. Right, there is our iterator at the beginning of the uh, iteration process. OK, how do you implement has next? Right here we know has next returns false. Right. So. How many elements are in the list? There's 15 elements in the list. Right. What is the next value for the iterator? It's also 15. Right. So as long as our next field. Is less than the number of elements in the list. Right, we know that there is another element. Right, so once again, there is the iterator at the point where it should return false, and where it has next should return false. Right, 15 elements in the list. Right, the next field belonging to that iterator is equal to 15. Right, so in order for there to be more, in order for uh, has next return true, right, it's the next field for this has to be less than 15 or has to be less than the size. Right. How do you get access to the size of the list? Right. So remember, you've got this crazy syntax. Right. I need to get access to the field belonging to S array list. Right. So the syntax is the name of the class. So it's S array list dot this dot size. Right. Um, and so that syntax there is what you have to write to get access to the uh, enclosing classes fields. How do you implement next? What that? Okay, so how do you implement next? Okay, so first thing you have to do is you have to test whether or not you can actually if there are actually any elements left. Right. So call has next. If has next is false, we throw an exception. Right. The exception that you're supposed to throw is one of these. Right. So it's a no such element exception. Right. All right. So let's suppose there are elements left. So what do you what do we need to do? Right, we want to return the element at index this dot next. Right. Now, how do I get to that element? Right. So I have access to the array lists uh, fields. So I could go into the array and get that element directly. Right. So in other words, I can write this. Uh, sorry, s array list dot this dot a r r square bracket this dot next. That would be fine. Right. Here I'm just calling get which is slightly inefficient, right? Why is it slightly inefficient? Because get tests the index, right? I know the index is valid. Whoops, sorry. I know the index is valid because I got past has next. Right. All right, so that gives me the element to return, right? So I'm going to return that at the end, right? Now, now what else does the uh, method have to do? Well, it has to advance the iterator one position to the right, right? How do I advance it one position to the right? Well, I can make next go up by one. What I can't do is I can't make previous go up by one. Right. The reason I can't make previous go up by one is because when I remove an element, I'm going to set previous to minus one. Right. So if I just add one to it, that's going to make it zero, which is not necessarily where the iterator actually is in the sequence. Right. So the trick here is to set previous to the current value of next. Right. So you don't want to write this previous plus plus here. That's going to blow up on you. Uh, after you implement remove. All right, so in the next class, I guess I'll tell you how to implement remove. Right. Uh, so there's a few things you have to pay attention to when you do that. Uh, and so I guess we're out of time. Yeah, we're more or less out of time. Uh, and so we'll talk about that in the next lecture.